Hi, John. Thank you very Hello. much for joining us. How are you? I'm good. Thank you very much for having me and everyone for coming. You're in the, in the bright lights now, yeah. yeah I know. <laughs> um, well, yeah, thank you very much for joining us at Nice to Tuesdays. I thought we would start from uh, the very beginning, if that's all right, your, your upbringing, because I know your, your brother, your younger brother, Nikolai, is also an artist and a that's musician. Right. Um, yeah. He's a sculptor, I think, as yeah. well. Um, so how much were you encouraged to be really creative when you were, um, when you were growing up? Was it a big part of your life, kind of um, being creative in art? I don't think we were encouraged, but we were not discouraged. Okay. Um, my my dad was like really into pop culture, so there was a lot of like comic books and music and movies lying around. And my mom was um, working as an architect and curator, so she would take us to some shows she was curating, and so we got uh, we got like a fair mix of highbrow and lowbrow, which okay. was nice and. But it wasn't really pushed on us. It was just sort of like part of the culture. And I come from a city called Nantes, uh, which is, in France at least, known for um, a lot of uh, street culture. Um, not like graffiti and stuff, but more like street theater. And um, now there's this thing called the Voyage à Nantes, which organizes a lot of events in the streets all around. We had this company called Royal Deluxe, which used to organize um, like you would have giants walking through the city, you would have like a giant book opening with the story of friends being narrated by actors and this kind of stuff. So there was a, a, a nice eclectic mix of creative outputs throughout my childhood. Um, yeah. Uh, interesting. I know there's a there's a contingent from Nantes in, in the studio, uh, in the audience yeah, tonight. So, Hello, uh, <laughs> um, and I guess, I mean, you, t you mentioned there like highbrow and lowbrow, which I think is something really interesting. We'll probably come onto that in a little bit, but um, you, you studied graphic design. You went on to study graphic design at Central St. Martins here in London. Um, you're obviously now known more as an artist and illustrator, but how much do you think graphic design, that kind of background and that grounding in graphic design kind of plays into your work now? Um, a lot. I think, I think that sort of, um, yeah, it's always been there. I studied in a very um, more old school pragmatic um, course in France for three years before coming to St. Martins and to learn like the basis of typography, composition, color, and all of that. And, and when I came to St. Martin, it, the, the way of teaching was quite different. It was very playful, and we're encouraged to try video, advertising, illustration, bookmaking, everything. Um, but I think even now when I do paintings, like surf paintings and things like that, just the, the way to compose the painting is the same way I would compose a poster. And you know, the way I would do the trees in, a, in an almost um, uh, turning them as icon in their own sort of like visual alphabet is the same I would compose poster with typography. Um, so I think it's, it's sort of like the, the backbone of everything that I do, no matter the medium. And what, uh, I guess at what point did you realize that you didn't want to be a graphic designer? I guess that was at one point the, the dream, but um, no, when I did you realize? At it. <laughs> I was just not very good at it. Um, no, but also I, I, I don't know, you know, I never wanted to be an illustrator or, or a painter. I, I don't think I ever wanted to be, uh, maybe a uh, comic book and animation when I was younger, because that's the stuff that I used to, uh, to obsess over. But when I was in St. Martin's, I didn't decide on a, on a path, and that was super exciting. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to keep that freedom to be able to not have to decide. And the next, I guess the next step for you is you went on to the Royal College of Art for your MA in, in visual communication. I, I found this statement online, which is something that you wrote about your, your final project. And um, it is a bit long, but I thought I'd read it in full because it oh it's also fascinating. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, but it's genuinely fascinating. And it kind of, it, it speaks to your work now even, but right. you might find this a little bit embarrassing. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but you said, for my degree, I've worked on a series of minimal and practical images that are aimed at a mass audience. Rather than produced solely for a crowd of visual arts connoisseurs, to be viewed only in specialized spaces and publications, I try to use the commercial and public domain to create a visual language that aims to make people laugh and think. Visually based in the continuity of a certain tradition of poster art, I've bent this communication tool used mainly for commercial purposes to provoke a dialogue on contemporary matters that people can relate to, which I think is just like a lovely way of... Uh... That sounds very pompous. <laughs> How much of that do you still kind of agree with? Or does um, it... I think the, I, I totally uh, don't acknowledge, uh, <laughs> I'm very embarrassed by it, but no, I, 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 I know what I was trying to say and, and, and for sure, like I still have an, a very strong appetite for um, 
a fair divide between highbrow and lowbrow. Um, social media or museum versus gallery or client work, um, I don't want to choose one direction and that's why I enjoy the practice that I'm in at the moment is that I, I get to do a bit of everything. I touched a bit in the gallery work and it's very good because it pays the rent, but then museum is open to all and, and super important socially, I think. And you don't actually, you don't say the same thing based on the platform. So if you have many things to say or if you're unsure about certain things, then there's a platform for that. And, and diversity helps you to be able to express different ideas for different people. And how did people respond to that work? I guess, you know, you talked about it being minimal and practical. When you were, you know, at that early stages of your career, did people, I don't know, they think it was maybe too, too practical, too minimal. How was that received either at the RCA or, or just afterwards? Um, well, I think at the, it, it was complicated at the RCA because I got asked to, um, to decide on a path, illustration or graphic design, and I didn't feel like I was a good illustrator or a good graphic designer, and I, I just wanted to continue playing. And at the same time, I, I was lucky to, um, to have landed a, a few commissions, uh, and I wanted to make the most of them and keep doing them. So I, I used the studio and made some really good friends, met some really interesting people, but I'm not sure I was the best student uh, <laughs> at following the courses, but that's okay. Yeah, no, absolutely, that's perfectly okay. Um, I guess, which other designers and artists were your kind of biggest influences back then? You know, we, we, I've read that statement, but um, yeah, wh who do you think was kind of influencing your thinking about your work back then? Well, I always say the same, but like in terms of um, all the big names like Paul Rand and Saul Bass, all the people that sort of were graphic designers working for the industry, but had that little bit of... Um, they had something else that, you know, they, they could function as artists in the same time as they could function for an industry. And I did find that extremely interesting that um, everybody has to pay the rent, but if you can do that and still have a bit of your essence mm -hmm. into it, then you also paint pictures on billboards, which yeah. is better than just sell a product. Um, and otherwise, Tommy Angerer and Sampé and a, a lot of people that were very good, in my opinion, at dividing between commercial and personal and sort of try to document uh, the world they were living in at the time. Someone like Tommy Anger did some children's book, he did a lot of amazing political posters um, at the time of the Vietnam War or, or other eras like the Nixon era. And he did some very intense pornographic drawing at the same time. So he was like playing in many different fields but somehow it created a a coherent body of work and that's something that I was like, this is cool, this, this is good. This is nice to have the freedom to break out of the path that you feel like you're being given. I mean, how much, how difficult is it to kind of keep those things separate and make sure that you're working on kind of personal work and you have your personal practice and at the same time doing the, yeah, maybe slightly more commercial things that as you say, kind of pay the rent? Um, I mean, you always have to pay the rent, so that's the one thing that you've got to make sure you do. Otherwise, like, I don't know, just, I try to play it by instinct a lot. You know, when I get sent a commission commercially, I try to see if it's something that I agree with uh, on a personal ethical point of view more and more now that I've got the, the, the luxury to be able to do that. And, and the rest of the time I keep producing for myself and, and, and work that try to say something that I want to say. Uh, so it's, it's always a fair balance, you know, between commercial and gallery work or between sketchbook and, and social media. Yeah. Um, in that statement, you kind of talk about making people laugh and think, which I guess is, is yeah, it's just something that your work has always managed to do right from the beginning. Um, to look at laughter first, I mean, how important is humor in your work? And I guess, what role do you feel like humor plays? Like, what are you trying to do when you're putting a joke into your work? I, I'm not trying very hard to be funny because I don't think I know how to be. But um, I think same as everyone, the news is terrible. And it's been consistently terrible for a while. It's, I don't think it's getting worse. It's just like we're getting more news. Mm. Um, and I guess through drawing, my reaction was to try to find something that bugs me and to try to twist it, reverse it. And sometimes it was funny, sometimes it was maybe witty. Um, but it was, it was more of a sort of defense mechanism 
that's the way I try to see it now, like with a bit of, of distance. Um, and, and it's going to sound really corny, but it's the same with painting. You know, the more I've got negative things on, on my mind, I try to find beauty or to find humor. And uh, it's more of a desperate attempt at countering the negative. Right. Is that what you mean it by... It takes different forms. Yeah, is that what you mean by defense mechanism, kind of trying to, I guess, find a positive in, in yeah. negative thoughts? Yeah, I think, I mean, that's, uh, that's the sort of something that I'm, I'm trying to um, formulate in, in, in the next year through a series of shows, but like it's, uh, it's akin to escapism. When reality becomes extremely dire, we all have different ways of coping with it. Some people play video games, some will see their friends, some will write a diary, some will do a video. Um, and for me, for a long time, my mechanism was to try to do daily cartoons about it, then it was to do landscape paintings about beauty, and now I'm trying to formulate other things in that direction. That sounds interesting. Yeah, can't wait to see that. Um, I mean, I guess the last time we spoke was during the pandemic, and yeah. that was definitely a time when you were really doing that, you know, finding the kind of slightly bleak but also funny sides of things that were happening in your everyday life at that time, right? Yeah, but um, it's good for inspiration. It's like, you know, whenever you have a wall in front of you, you have to find a way to climb over it. So it, it sort of lends itself well to creativity. You have to scratch your head to find how you're going to climb over it. And then five different people are going to have five different ways to deal with that wall. And during COVID, I think that's we all had this wall of COVID. And then you saw millions and millions of different ways to deal with that wall. And that was terrible, terrible times socially. But for a lot of people, quite an interesting time creatively. And we saw a lot of people, um, I think it's the same in England, but in France, like you, you hear a lot of new artists, comedians, musicians, graphic artists, painters, and a lot of them say, oh, yeah, it was during COVID that, you know, I had nothing to do but to try to entertain myself. So I came up with this or this. Yeah. So there was negative and there was positive response to it. Yeah, definitely. Um, I guess on the think side of things of that, that statement, your, your work kind of often uses this like subtle twist of meaning or there's a, a kind of witty reveal, I guess, to get people thinking. Um, I'm intrigued about like what the mental state is like that you have to get into to, to find those little moments of, of wit and, and humor. Um, is there a particular headspace that you have to be in to be that kind of, to find those little funny moments? Um, no, it's like my, my work process would have been based on observation. Like I was saying, I would see a situation or experience a situation, then try to reflect on it creatively. Same as you would find this glass and try to find a different use for it. It's like you have a situation, you turn that into a question, you try to find a good answer. And um, for the, the, the wit, the wit, sorry, French accent, but... Um, <laughs> A lot of the time I try to approach the image making or the comedy making the same way I was do um, uh, in graphic design how you would do advertising. You need to capture the attention of the viewer with a graphic, a situation, and then once you had that, that um, attention grabbed, you would be able to insufflate a, a second, more subtle level of, of, of meaning or reading. And sometimes it's through comedy, sometimes it's through graphic pun. It varies. Okay, so that graphic design background definitely For coming sure. in yeah. a lot there. Um, I guess in recent years you've been doing a lot more painting, and yeah, I mentioned it in the introduction, these like beautiful, colorful landscapes, of kind of natural landscapes, um, and you've been showing your work all around the world. I guess, what's made you want to move in this direction and do more of that work? Because it feels like there's, you're, you're doing more of that than, than ever before, unless that's yeah. just my perception. No, it's like, a, it's a weird, uh, it's, it's not like painting, as opposed to, um, it's not a divorce from drawing, but it, it all, it's quite organic. Like when I was in London, I was in London for 13 years and I was doing a lot of social media and I, I didn't have a family and I was going out a lot, I had a lot of freedom. And, and then certain things happened that maybe affected my, um, my mental health a little bit through social media and then I, I had a kid and a lot of things coincided and I just, it lends itself to taking a step back from a fast paced way of living and creating and try to reflect on other happier things, slower things. Um, I wanted to be available mentally for my kid and my family. 
and I discovered surfing in the same time, and you know, it's just sort of like planets aligning in a weird way, and, and, and you just decide to, to follow that. Mm. But I was always drawing in my sketchbook and, and, and still coming up with ideas based on situations. But so for a long time, it seemed like a divorced drawing, and it was used, I was used to a certain way of interacting with social media, and then when I started doing painting, it was like, I could see that I was losing a lot of my audience, and they're like, oh shit, do I, you know, should I continue and, and, and try to, should I get back into it to please the people that have been supporting me or should I try to follow what makes me feel good and what makes me happy? So I did that. And, and through a few years of doing that, I've been lucky enough to, to go through galleries and then be offered nice exhibition spaces. And there I could bring back the drawing in a different way, not through like hyper direct committee but more through bringing a bit of my sketchbooks on the wall. Actually, that's very good timing. <laughs> but um, yeah, there you, you had like those paintings where talking, it was for a show at the Museum of Contemporary Arts in, in Lyon in France. This was talking about tourism and the paintings were showing different sets of tourism and then through the walls I was playing with the idea and like rambling on a more comedy way about it. And, and now I've got this, I feel like I've got this graphic language that I'm using for bigger shows like museum shows where I can, I just finished a show in Belgium at the Mima Museum, which was called Studiolo. And the idea was like, I'm talking too much, but I feel like I want to talk about no, that. No, people are here for you. I think <laughs> okay. you can talk. <laughs> you can talk as much as you want. So, so last year in, tw in 2022, I had a retrospective show in, in Seoul, which sounds a bit ridiculous. Um, but uh, it, it was quite interesting because it was going through my first sketches in my sketchbook to all of the St. Martin's years the RCA, the first commercial work, um, and to the sculptures and the paintings that I do now. So it was like looking back, it was called Then, There. And then um, I did a show at the Mima Museum in, in, in Brussels, sorry, last year called Studiolo, which was trying to see like, where am I now? I've seen where I was and how I got there. Now I'm here, I'm like, I'm 40, I've got a kid, I'm very worried about this. And, uh, <laughs> You know, and everything seems to be dripping. And um, it was like, you know, let, let, let's, let's use this museum as a studio, which used to be like this little um, cabinet of curiosity where you would surround yourself with art and, and, and things that you liked in order to reflect on certain matters. So it was that. I talked about childhood, about environment, ecology, anxiety, all of that stuff through paintings and a lot of drawings and rambling on the walls. And, and it felt good. And you had this sort of like dungeon ascension through the museum where you would start with like black and white sketchbook drawings, very um, nombralistic, and then going into childhood, portraits, the individual, the individuals in society, et cetera, et cetera, to finish at the top in this big mural, which I think we've got somewhere there, um, which was just painting a 13 meters long fresco about the world. And it was a the reflection on, on how the collective is made of individual stories and had just presented my individual take and this was joining onto the collective, which is like a theme that I've always been quite interested in and, and I've, I feel like I've treated in, in many different endeavors. And next year I have a big show um, that I think is gonna be about escapism, like trying to talk about the collective and how from that collective we, we really, really have this inner desire to make society that's what makes us human, and, and that's what makes all the good stuff. But equally, it's extremely challenging. It's very uh, anxiety given. And, and, and we all find, as I was saying earlier, we all find ways to deal with that um, through like, I'm exploring like role playing games, video games, social circles of discussions, politics, and all of that stuff. Um, that sounds very messy, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll make that clear next year. <laughs> but um, that's where I'm at. No, it's amazing. I mean, I wanted to actually talk about that, um, this kind of 13 meter circular room that you, that you painted. Um, this mural, yeah, depicting the kind of history of the world in a, as you described it, very subjective and inaccurate way. Yeah. Um, it disappeared after the show. And I yeah. think I just wanted to ask, like, what's it like, I guess, knowing that something you've made, you know, you said it was one of your favorite pieces you've ever made and knowing that it's either gonna be painted over or dismantled at the end of a show, what's it like to, I guess, have something that you're that proud of that you're, 
eventually going to say goodbye to. Well, we had the discussion prior to it when we were building the show, and I was like, it's fine, it's, you know, it's for the art, it's, it's fine. And then when it got destroyed, I cried. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but like, without, without being as pompous as that, it, it's, it's nice to be able to do stuff like that. It's, um, again, like in a very digital age where uh, everything is accessible, and that's fantastic. But it's also nice to keep some stuff that you, you had to be there to experience it. Um, and I have this more and more I'm proposing when I do shows this ephemer um, installation. The next, all the next shows that I'm doing have sculptures and, and, and paintings and an installation that's going to be disappeared or painted over after. And I always have this, the people that I work with being like, that's just really dumb. And I'm like, yeah, but I, I get something from just doing it, like I do my sketchbook, you know. They're not meant to be shown, it's, it's just for the pleasure of doing it, and through... Also, I've always... I, I was talking about um, the work evolving in an organic way, but it's, like, it's serendipity, you know. It's just you, you unravel something, and then you, you, you let it carry on freely, and it takes you somewhere. And when I do work this way, I don't prepare for it. I just have this sort of like graphic and verbal diarrhea, and um, and then you look at the the result on the wall, and some stuff is terrible, some stuff is interesting, and I reuse the result of that to to go further in my practice, one way or another. I mean, you've you've talked about your sketchbooks a couple of times, and I wanted to touch on this because some of your f my favorite things that you've done have been you know, from sketchbooks and actually Thank you. There's, there's something really nice about the fact that you've done them very obviously very quickly and um, I guess there's a sort of freedom there and a lack of inhibition. How sort much, <laughs> but how much is there like a, a perfectionism in you that wants to make everything perfect versus that desire for freedom to just express yourself and as you said, kind of let it run because some of those things end up being kind of a bit imperfect in ways that are really, they very, are charming. Very though. imperfect. But, uh, <laughs> Um, that's something that I keep from St. Martin's or from the time of being a student, actually just finding, uh, having the, the need to fail, to have a space where you can fail consistently. And when you fail, it's not failing, it's just trial and errors. Mm. And the sketchbook's always been that. And when I was studying at St. Martin or, or the RCA, we were encouraged to, to do that. To, it was a non-commercial space, so you know, the, the implication of the failure were not economic. Mm. It was just like, oh, you know, you miss that exercise, you'll do better next time. And that's just so important. And also, when you don't worry about the results, again, serendipity helps, and, and, and you'll eventually find it will create accidents that you'll look back and be like, oh, this is cool, this is not cool, this is cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that somehow doesn't illustrate that. <laughs> Yeah. How hard have you found that? I mean, you, you talk about it being, you know, kind of drilled into you as a student, and I think, you know, lots of people will find that that atmosphere that's very kind of welcoming to that kind of failure is, is what happens at university. But how hard is it as a practicing artist with a big following to maintain that level of experimentation and not, not be too afraid of the audience or critique? I'm terrified of the audience. Right. Uh, no, I really am actually. That's why like social media gives me so much anxiety that I, I, I approach it differently now. Like I, I, I've taken a step back and I'd like to think of the output that I, the work that I do as um, I really like the way musicians do it. A musical career when you, you put out albums, mm. you know, and you're, you're cooking in the dark for months and then you put out something like a show, an album and then you, you advertise it, you show the ropes of it and all of that, and then you, you take a step back out and, and you do that. Mm. I can't remember what your question was. Neither can I. Oh, that's we'll fine. move on. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd love to discuss a bit more. I mean, you've talked about a couple of kind of recent projects. Um, last year, you had a project at the Jardin des Plantes mm -hmm. uh, in Nantes, which is yep. where you were kind of born and raised. What was it like going back to your kind of childhood home and making this amazing project that was, yeah, took over a kind of entire garden there? Yeah, we did that for three years, which was amazing because it's a garden that I used to walk through when I was a kid. Um, and it was sort of the first time I'd been, Nantes has actually been giving me my, twice my, my biggest projects. Like the first one was Lenny, and this, uh, the Jardin des Plantes was another one where it was amazing because the, it was the first time I was being paid to do a public art commission where I could do whatever I wanted. 
And for that, I wanted to revisit um, the little paper characters that I was doing at St. Martin's before I, I was sort of like doing illustration. And when I wasn't confident enough with my line, I was just sort of experimenting with paper characters and cutting them out, photographing them. And these little paper sculptures, then I would put black lines and this became illustration. But I wanted to take that out and challenge the, um, the perception of the audience. And because I was supported by all the teams of the gardens and the makers that they had, it, it was awesome. Amazing. And That's it's still so on now. So like we, we did three years. And after the three years, some of them left. And we've kept three. One is in the garden. One is on the, the roof of the town hall. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like pulling plants all over the town hall. And another one is, is sort of rolling rolls of tarmac to reveal plants underneath. But I'm super happy with that. It's Amazing. really nice. So the one in the middle of the lake spitting the water up, that one's gone, is it? Yeah, we're, it's actually very difficult to find new homes for these things. Oh, really? They're big. <laughs> yeah. yeah, very specific to that place. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, we're going to have some audience questions now because I know, um, yeah, we had so many great ones uh, submitted. So I'm going to go through these ones, um, and there's about six of them. But the first one is from Joanna. Um, are you able to keep your graphic diary still as a kind of no pressure, fun thing? Or does it kind of now feel part of part of your job, part of your... No, no, it's definitely life. a no-pressure thing, but it's, it, its content has changed a lot. When we did the show in Seoul, um, we exhibited 20 years of, of sketchbooks. And um, looking back at the beginning, I was noting down, like writing down every single word that everybody around me was saying. So I had to like find like one page out of a hundred that, that I could show because the rest was like my brother's filthy mouth. <laughs> and. Uh, and then progressively a lot of like student life went into it and then first ideas for projects then using them for painting experimentations and then when I started having kids I had less time obviously because though I would have been pretty shitty dad otherwise. <laughs> um, but now, I, now it's a mix now when, when I travel I can like do a lot into it but I always try to keep it as a space of experimentation for projects and every now and again doing live drawings but it's something that I want to keep forever. It's just life gets in the way. Yeah, amazing. Um, the second question is from Elena. How do you get from what you see in reality to the stylized version of your work? So what's that process of, as you said earlier, kind of seeing something like the, the glass on the table mm -hmm. to then the very stylized version that we might see at the end of the process? Um, if I was pompous, I would say it's uh, synthetic. But um, no, it's just I've got, I've got very uh, limited drawing skills, and um, it's very true. I'm not, uh, and so from an early, early age, I was like, I'm, I, I can't shadow, I can't do body mass, I can't do perspective and all that stuff, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep it to a minimum, and I'll try to develop a visual alphabet with that minimum that is not strong enough, but I'm comfortable enough with to articulate the ideas that I want to say. Um, and you don't, need, you don't need much. I think like in general, graphics is about synthesizing the world into different elements, and that automatically creates an alphabet that you reuse throughout your work. And mine happens to be with bold colors and a simple black line. So it, it's, I think the simplicity of it and, and the fact that it doesn't evolve um, my friend Gwendol Lebeck, really great illustrator, but he's looking at my work, he's like, wow, your, your work has not evolved in 20 years, amazing. And I, and I was like, oh. I was so sad. But, uh, you know, like, that's what makes it a style. It's just a lack of progression. <laughs> that's a bit of a neg, isn't it? Um, a question here from Indigo. Uh, do you have any tips on staying motivated? So what are the, the tricks and tips over the years that you've found to keep um, yourself inspired and keep yourself motivated? I think it's, a, it's a, a healthy balance between the commercial and the personal. And when, you, when I feel demotivated on a personal level, um, like, you know, when I feel like I, I'm not finding the ideas that I want to find, and then I've got a commercial project that makes me, I have to do it because I have to pay the rent. And, and when you have a commercial project, then you... Um, you get given a brief, it's simple, you have to come up with an answer, and it's like uh, going to the gym. You know, you, you do the exercise, and through doing the exercise, stuff happens, and you, you, you get the pump back, and, and then you get back into your personal space, and you use that energy to try to uh, 
come up with ideas. And sometimes it doesn't work, but uh, <laughs> it's a nice idea. I understood everything apart from the bit about the gym, but yeah. <laughs> uh, George asks, what was the process for designing and publishing your first coffee table book? Um, I work with my friend Erwan Lucier, which is a really good designer as well. And uh, we had done a book before for um, Nanzuka, Gallery in Japan, where I really liked his, his process. Um, he always tried to approach bookmaking in a specific way. So for uh, the book at Nanzuka, it was like a, a sketchbook. And for um, the fight and coffee table book, he wanted, he wanted it to be a story. Um, originally, it was meant to be like a proper storybook, but it sort of slowly evolved into the narrative that I was mentioning before, where you go from a very personal... Am I, did you put the sound up? <laughs> from a very personal point of view to then close friends and family to then a wider audience. And uh, so we, we, we work like that. Then first you had the sketchbooks and the paintings where I was um, talking to my parents and then the collaboration with people like K-Studio that I've worked with and, and then the more public art and things like that. Um, finally, a question from Marianne. So there's a group of friends from Nantes in the audience. Um, <laughs> how has your work evolved since Le Nid? Le Nid? I'm not sure. Le, Le Nid, yeah. Le Nid. Uh, it, you might have to describe what that is as well. Le Nid was like, uh, I was still at the RCA when I got given the amazing commission. It was um, at the top of um, the biggest building in Nantes. And it was to design um, a space that would be as much uh, an art piece as a public space. And so I, I was a student, so I decided to do a bar. And um, the idea was to have um, a giant bird, it was like 41 meters long, going all around the, the inside of the building. And, and then the bar would be inside the bird, he would sit on his neck or on his head. He had like animated eyes that soon became broken, but that was meant to close and open. <laughs> and then all the seats and tables were eggs. I got to design posters on, on every you know, big part of the city that I liked. It was like a sort of all-encompassing project. And the stuff that I've taken from that is that the, the multiplicity of mediums and to try to create one current coherent narrative with different languages is something that I've always enjoyed and I try to keep doing with like sculpture, product, design, um, painting, drawings, everything. Amazing. We're nearly out of time, but one final question for, for me is just, um, we were talking earlier about the number of things you've got coming up this year, and um, it'd be great to just hear what, what you have got lined up, because, um, yeah, we kind of all want to know where we can see your work this year. Um, so I'm currently working on a project in Paris, which is like my first big project in Paris, called, um, it, it will be at the Bon Marché, which is like a really old uh, department store, and we're doing two giants, it's, it's something about the books, and in the window displays, I'm creating a story, like a, like a storybook, but an installation. So every window will show a different chapter of the story. And then uh, at the top, we'll have um, a cafe um, where you'll be, step into a library. Um, but yeah, you should see that. And then in, in March, I've got a show in New York, which will be half installation, half paintings. And then working on a, on a TV show about my parents as well, an animated TV show. And then I'm working on that show about escapism um, next year. Um, some other bits. But, yeah. yeah. So just a chill, just a chill 2024 just a for chill. you. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Um, listen, I, we are out of time, I'm afraid. Cool. But everyone, Thank a massive, massive much. round of applause Thank for Jean-Julien. Thank you very much.